We're ready to go. So welcome everybody and Happy New Year. Uh, just to start this year off in such a fantastic way, uh, you'll be probably as surprised as I am to find me up here. That's because Darren is still at home. He received the news this morning that Lily has tested positive for uh, COVID. So he becomes a primary contact and is not allowed to associate with people like us. So uh, <laughs> he is going to be preaching from home. And we've been running around this morning trying to get all the technology working. So he will come up on the screen at the appropriate time and he will still be able to bring us the message. But consequently, things have been thrown in a bit of disarray. So please be patient with us. We will do our best to uh, keep things running. But it's great that we have all these tools at our disposal to be able to gather together in worship. And so we do that now as uh, I'll, I'll read Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6, which Darren would have done if he was here. And uh, then we'll pray and we'll worship our God. So Hebrews chapter 13 and just verse 6. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And I've got to say, just those words are appropriate for right at this time. Uh, Darren will be speaking to us this morning, as I'm sure you read, you're staying in touch. And we'll be covering uh, courage as an underlying element, uh, a characteristic for a number of different um, virtues over the coming, I can't remember, six or eight weeks or something. Uh, so it, it's good to start the year with that in mind, 2022 will hopefully be a much better year than 2021 was. But let's come to our God in, in prayer now. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that it is indeed our delight to come to you in worship this morning. And despite all the difficulties that we might face, the challenges that come to us, we, we understand that your hand is behind all such things and that there is good purpose in them. And so we, we ask and invite you to come and to move among us, to work within us as we offer ourselves in worship this morning, as we hear your living word spoken, uh, sorry, your written word spoken, as we look to the living word to do his work in us, as we ask your spirit to guide us, enlighten our minds, encourage our hearts, uh, be with us in our worship, that all that we do would be glorifying to our Saviour and our Lord. Father, we thank you that we uh, are able as uh, the family of God to care and minister to one another and we ask that in our worship this morning, during the service and after the service, that we would in fact be doing that. Help us to care for one another well, that through our love for each other, we might declare the gospel indeed and that might in fact cause others outside who witness such things to give you, our Heavenly Father, all the glory you deserve. Father, we pray particularly this morning as we gather that you would help us to uh, focus our hearts and our minds on the thing that matters most, and that is Jesus, our Lord, that we would be conscious to uh, put away, consciously put away all things that would be a distraction. It is a great time of the year, a time of celebration, and yet there are, uh, that itself can be a distraction, and there are also others who find this time of the year a very difficult time and it brings back memories that are perhaps not pleasant. And these too can be a distraction. We pray that you would lift up the downhearted, that you would encourage and help those who are uh, buoyed by good things to share with those who have less. And that together we might celebrate the gift of life as we look to 2022, not knowing what it holds, but trusting the one who holds it and who holds us. So, Father, be with us in our worship. Help us, to having prepared properly, to come before you, bowing our knees in humble worship and receive a gift from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now, To God Be the Glory. the glory great things he has done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded 
his life an atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing, through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be Our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. All right, kids, up the front. Time for kids' cat. Let's go. Come on. Come on, Lee. Come on. Oh, grab a seat. Morning kids, my name's Phil. I'm going to do the kids cat with you this morning. We'll start with some review. How well do we know our questions, do you reckon? We could do some easy ones, eh? Uh, can someone put their hand up and tell me, why did God make you in all things? Yes. Why did God make you in all things? Uh, why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. Very good. Uh, how about... Someone put their hand up for in how many persons does this one God exist? Yes, Lucy. How many persons? Three. God exists in three persons. Very good. A little bit harder one. Who knows what the fifth commandment is? Does anyone know? What's the sign for the fifth? Ah, surely someone knows. Yes, obey your mother and father. Very good. You're the winner, I reckon. All right, who wants to play a game with me? Riley's going to come up because he's going to show us how to do it. I need two, maybe three more people. Yeah, you can come up. Uh, Gus, you'll be good. How about, how about a, that's someone that's trying to get someone else to come up? So you can come up. <laughs> All right. This game's called French Skipping. Have you ever played French Skipping before? We've got some French people here. I'm sure they know how to do it. All right. I need you. Can you stand over here? And can you put your feet over that? All right. And hold feet a bit wider apart. Yep. Very good. And then Gus, do you want to come over here and do the same thing? All right. Now, this game's got a set of rules, and you have to follow them perfectly to win it. All right. So Riley's going to show us. You've got to jump, skip over it. So the first one he does, you show us Riley. So he jumps in with one foot either side. Then the next one, both sides. And then feet well, well done. Now he's got to go both feet in the middle. All right, now it gets tricky. He's got to jump on top of it. And now this is a really hard part. He's got to do jump up, do a spin. Hey, and he did it. Well done, Riley. So he did that perfectly. Do you reckon you can do it? All right, have a go. Oh, you're a good... Yep, and then now both over 
outsides, yep, and then both inside, and then both on it, and then you got to jump and do a spin. Ah, oh, well done, you guys are good at this. Took me like 10 tries before I got it right. Do you reckon we should make one of the adults do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, he's French, so that would make sense, wouldn't it? Mr. Saviot, come on, let's go. Do you reckon he can do it? Well, the rules of the game is you start around your ankles, and then it gets a bit higher and higher each time you go up. So because he's an adult, we'll make it a bit harder for him. So we'll put it up a bit. And s- do you reckon he can do it? Let's see how he goes. So you've got to do one foot either side first. No, no, no. He's already mucked it up. So start on the outside. And you've got to jump in with one foot either side of this rope. Ah, good job. Now, one foot either side of this rope on your next jump. No, no, one foot either side. So one foot in, one foot out on that one. That's it. Now, both feet outside. Now, both feet inside. He's doing well. Now, both feet on the rope. Now, this is a tricky one. You've got to jump up and do the spin. Ah, oh, almost. He was very close, though, wasn't he? Very close. All right, good job. We'll jump out. We can... Have a play of that afterwards if everyone else wants to have a go after church. Now, how did we win the game? You had to follow the rules perfectly, didn't you? Do you guys know what perfect means? Can someone tell me what perfect means? Riley, what does perfect mean? Yeah, exactly. So no mistakes and doing the best you possibly can. Where's my book? So Riley did it pretty well and so did... The curry boy. (laughs) And Mr. Saviot made a mistake, so he mucked it up. What about in life? Do you guys ever make mistakes in life, or do you do it perfectly all the time? I know Riley doesn't do it perfectly all the time, because I get to tell him off lots. He makes lots of mistakes. He punches his sisters, and he annoys them. Sometimes you might tell a lie. Do you guys sometimes make mistakes and get in trouble? Well, what about Jesus? Did you think Jesus made mistakes? No. Nah. So our question today, number 51, is what kind of life did Christ live on earth? Does anyone know the answer? It's a bit of a long one. Yeah? Oh, that's very good. So the answer is Christ lived a life of perfect obedience to the law of God. So he would have done the French skipping perfectly, but he did life perfectly as well. That's a good one to remember. I'll just say it once more so we remember, what kind of life did Christ live on earth? And the answer is, Christ lived a life of perfect obedience to the law of God. All right, let's pray and then we'll sing our song. All right, close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you sent him to earth and we thank you that uh, even though we can't be perfect and that we have sinned and done the wrong thing, that he uh, lived a perfect life for us on this earth, Lord. And we thank you that he died he saved us for, from our sins, Lord, and that he rose again uh, to be with you. And that because of that, we might be with you on earth too, Lord. Uh, so we thank you for all these things in his precious name. Amen. All right. Let's sing our song. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. He cried, oh, 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 show me the way. Show me the truth. Show me the light. The way to go home, baby. Uh, 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 uh. The crippled man sat by the road and he cried. The crippled man sat by the road and he cried. The crippled man sat by the road and he cried. He cried, oh, 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 show me the way. Show me the truth. Show me the light. The way to go home, baby. Uh, 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 uh. Jesus sat by the road and he cried. Jesus sat by the road and he cried. Jesus sat by the road and he cried, he cried, oh, 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 I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, the way to go home, baby, uh, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus,
Our reading for this morning will be coming from the book of Joshua. Uh, We're going from chapter 1, verses 1 through to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, uh, somehow I trust this is all working. Uh, It's not exactly how I had the planned uh, the Lord's Day. And I know uh, Daniel alluded to this, that um, this is a series today starting on courage, but this idea of the courage to face failure, well, from about 8.46 when we got the positive uh, COVID result on Lily, that was on all of our minds. How are we going to get, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get the technology work? So God has been gracious. I trust it is working. Um, and that everything will go well, God willing. So I'm going to pray, and then once I pray, then what we'll do is we'll hear from God's word. Let's pray. Our gracious King, uh, we are mindful uh, for your goodness towards us. We pray that you would uh, speak to us through your word, that you would bring clarity to our mind, Uh, We ask that as we uh, meditate upon the text of Joshua, uh, upon this issue of courage, that your spirit would do its work of conviction, uh, that he might uh, strengthen us in this virtue that underpins all virtues. And so to this end, we commend ourselves to you. We pray that you would um, work through the preaching of your word to sanctify your people and to instruct us Uh, in the way forward, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, tucked away somewhere in your Old Testament is the Book of One Chronicles, um, and let me just pause for one moment. All right, are we good? Excellent. Hopefully, now we're good. So tucked away in the Old Testament, you've got the Book of One Chronicles, Chapter 12, and it's it's probably not a well-read chapter, and it's it's, it's mostly a genealogy of all the men who fought with David. Uh, And it begins uh, by describing those men as the mighty men of valour or or men of courage. And then what you get in verse 32 is it says that the men of Issachar were men of understanding of the times so that they knew what Israel ought to do. So what you get is this picture of a man of courage who 
of times, times that will become, it seems to me, increasingly challenging for Christians, uh, but, uh, but in particular for the church. church. You see, you see the, the generations the church has enjoyed uh, what, what, might what might be perceived as cultural approval or cultural acceptance, uh, where, where following, following Jesus probably, probably didn't cost a whole lot. I didn't cost anyone their jobs or their reputation. Um, um, there's, I, th I think, to a, 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 an, extent, an extent, being a being Christian in previous generations was not a difficult thing. thing. The church, the church was largely viewed as a positive institution. Um, and in many ways, we're probably at worst sore as ambivalent, but at best worthy of respect. But, but I think we all sense there's been a cultural change. And in this cultural change, the state is no longer ambivalent to the church's teachings, and particularly its teachings on the exclusivity of Christ, of marriage, of sexuality, and it's becoming increasingly hostile and intrusive. Just recently, Just recently, when they, when they were, were having the discussion about the discrimination, discrimination bill, bill uh, in, uh, federal in federal parliament, parliament the, head the head of Equality Australia argued that, that uh, to, to say, say marriage is between a man and a woman is actually in an offensive statement. statement. To say, say that marriage is between a man and a woman is an offensive statement. statement. David, David Marr wrote, wrote in The Guardian, there's a follow-up, that, that to say such a thing is a nasty and hateful statement. In Victoria, in Victoria, our government has made praying for someone or counselling someone who has uh, perhaps conflicted over their sexuality or their gender, has made that illegal. In Victoria, uh, this year, it will be illegal to require employees at Christian schools to be, well, Christian. Apparently, Apparently, the government believes, believes that requiring employees to believe and practice, and practice the teachings of Jesus is immoral and therefore it is unlawful. Now, now I'm not a cultural bedwetter, nor am I encouraging you to be anxious about these things. And I certainly don't describe to the view that the, 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 the church is um, experiencing hard persecution. This is, this is still soft intrusions of the state into the church. But I do, but I do think it's fair to say that both, that both the institutions of home and church can expect, as a trajectory, we can expect further hostility and further intrusions of the state. And so by way of context, I want to start this series, and it'll be short today, but we'll unpack it as we go on. I want to start off with two propositions. Here's the first one. That, that I've just, just argued, argued that we can expect as we move forward that the intrusion of the state uh, within, our within our lives to increasingly assert itself, particularly, particularly over, over the institutions of home and church, and, church, and a desire to, to uh, pursue, pursue a sort of social and sexual uh, conformity to the, to the views of the states. And, and as a corollary, or that is, as a consequence of that, Here's the second proposition. Therefore, one of the great needs for both the home and the church is to have Christian men and women who excel in the virtue of courage and, more than that, can understand the times. You see, I, I reckon this is how it works. In previous generations, the soft virtues, and what I mean by soft virtues, it's not meant to be uh, a dismissive or derogatory phrase, but the softer virtues like, like um, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, they were actually needed in a culture that could be quite cruel and harsh, judgmental, unforgiving. In, in a cultures, cultures in past where, where to, be honest, to be honest, uh, lives, lives were cheap. A people of colour were, were considered second-class citizens. Uh, justice, justice was often compromised and selective according to privilege. You got, you got women, women who were often treated like property and children who had no rights. And so in a culture which is, in a sense, uh, coarse or harsh or cruel even, the softer virtues, like, like compassion, mercy, forgiveness, are actually countercultural. The poor, the, poor, the weak, weak, and the defenceless are worthy of love, and the church needs to tell people that. The church needs to stand on that. It needs to be a beacon for love and compassion and mercy, and almost to embrace those things which are countercultural. 
Now, the difficulty is our culture has changed. And, and, so, and so our, our culture is no longer cruel and harsh and, 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 and it's no longer camped on the heart of virtues, but our culture now extols almost exclusively the softer virtues. And the trouble is the church hasn't changed, hasn't picked up on that change. The evangelical church hasn't changed. But we still only have eyes for the gentle, softer virtues. We want all of our leaders to be gentle and congenial men. We, we, we actually worry that robust men will upset people in an age that seems that, 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 that we're almost every take on masculinity is that it's toxic. And it seems like the church, the evangelical church, is actually fixated on the softer or the gentler virtues. But if you understand the times, if you can read the culture well, we are actually culturally knee-deep in the softer, gentler virtues. And so if you want to be countercultural, then we will need to be men and women and young people who are actually willing to embrace the harder virtues, but justice, and honour, and duty. And I'm going to argue particularly in this series, courage. We know when Paul lists the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, most of those soft virtues, make no mistake, courage should be added in there. That's not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's meant to simply be a list that primes the pump. Courage is a virtue, and I will argue courage is a virtue that underpins all the other virtues. Especially in times of trial and tribulation. See, in, in previous generations, our grandparents or great-grandparents, they were better at the hard virtues They were because they reflected their culture. And, and so they were really, really good at, 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 at duty, at justice, things like that. And what they had to learn to do for the sake of the gospel is to model the softer virtues like compassion and love and forgiveness and grace. But now, but now in our generation, our generation, it is, it is knee deep in the softer virtues. And so are we because we've grown up in this culture. But for the sake of the gospel, we need to relearn those harder virtues. And I don't think that's going to be easy because it seems to me the evangelical church is wedded to the softer virtues and also, I think, to cultural approval. And so there's the two propositions that are underpin this series. One, that culturally, as you understand the times, you will see an increasingly assertive and at times hostile state with a desire for conformity to its social and sexual agenda for both the home and the church. And then as a corollary or as a consequence of that proposition, here's the second one that this will require the church, men and women, to grow in the virtue of courage because they understand the times. So it seems like the perfect time for us as we begin this new year to do a, a six-week, seven-week series on courage <coughs> because in a hostile culture, virtue, that, 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 that virtue of courage will actually underpin all the others. In a hostile culture, if you are not courageous, you won't stand on truth. You won't be, you won't be brave enough to follow Jesus. And so we're going to track courage. First, in a, a brief little view of, of Joshua chapter 1, and then we're going to track it through some of the men and women of the Old Testament until finally we track it all the way to Jesus. And so let's look at our briefly, look at our text. We're in Joshua 1. Uh, by way of context, Moses is dead. Now, remember, Moses is a giant in the land, is a giant among God's people. Moses is the one who experienced the burning bush. Moses is the one who spoke to Pharaoh. Moses is the one who, who, who God used to bring judgment upon Pharaoh in Egypt with the, the plagues. Moses was the one who parted the sea brought the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Moses is the one who led Israel in those 40 years of wandering and perhaps even grumbling. And now Moses is dead. Look at verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. So, so here, is, here is Yahweh speaking to Joshua and he says, listen, my man Moses is dead. You are now the man. You are the one I am going to use as a conduit to lead my people. The thing is, though, for Joshua is that he can remember what it was like when Moses was leading. He remembers the, all those congregational meetings in the wilderness where, you know, the people grumbled and complained against the leaders and particularly against Moses. And if you were to skip down to verse 17 in chapter 1, here are those same people saying to their new leader, Joshua, just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so will we obey you. And Joshua's thinking, obey Moses? Are you serious? You did nothing but grumble for 40 years. It would be like me saying to Ruth on my wedding day, just as I have loved vegetables, so I will love you. Hold on. I never loved vegetables. So that's not really encouraging. And yet, despite that, God calls Joshua to lead these people into the promises, despite how difficult they are. Look at verses 3 and 4. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. And so, in essence, what he's, 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 he's reminding him of those covenant promises. In fact, the covenant promises started with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and now Moses. And he says, well, we're right here. <laughs> you, I, I promise you that your family will become as, 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 as much as the sea is on the, uh, the, the sand is on the seashore. Well, look at them. You're a huge nation now. And I promise you not only family but land and blessing. And you're right here on the precipice the very land that I promised Moses I'm about to give to you and to the people. Verse 5 says, no man, no man, no, no nation, no force will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And then you get this uh, threefold exhortation a command even be strong and courageous therefore therefore given that i've made the promise given that i've said no one will defeat you given that i've said that i am with you and i have promised you i will not leave you and i will not forsake you given those things you be strong and courageous not just because of my promises but because of my presence just the way Moses, so I'm with you. I will not forsake you. And does that ring a bell? It rings a bell because here is, here is God making this promise that I'm with you and I will not forsake you. Therefore, go do what I've told you to do as they enter into the land. And, and, and it sort of mind flicks to the Great Commission where Jesus is, is sending his church, his people into the world, and, and he tells them what they've got to do. And they're going to have to be strong and courageous as they make disciples, they make disciples. But what's the promise? What's the encouragement? His presence. And I will be with you to the very end of the ages. And so God is reminding him the strength for you to do my will is my promise and my presence. And that's a, a game changer. It's sort of like, you know, when you've got kids and they're unsure about an activity, but an adult presence supervising, assisting, watching the child. It emboldens them. It encourages them. So too with God. God is encouraging Joshua. And, he, and he, what he does is the command to be courageous is wedded to the promise of his presence. 
Now, now, you know, as you know, courage courage is simply the resistance to fear, not the absence of it. Courage is, is simply the resistance to fear, the, you know, that where fear camps and crouches all around us and it wants to present, it, it wants to sort of disable us. And what courage is, courage is in the is the resistance to that controlling effect of fear. It's not the absence of it. Courage is willing to do God's word, to do our duty, even when it's hard or scary. There can be no courage if there is no fear. God's promised presence is actually there to help us resist the controlling nature of fear. Be strong and courageous. That is why uh, we arranged for Daniel uh, to have that reading from Hebrews 13. Uh, here is Luke probably writing Hebrews. Uh, and he says, we can confidently say, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So he's done, he's, he's, he's processed the promises. He's processed God's presence. And he says, therefore, if that is true, and if God is omniscient and omnipotent, what do I fear? If the Lord is with me, if he is my helper, what can man do to me? Look at verse 7 in the text. So he's told him, I will be with you. I will not forsake you. He's promised his presence. And then there's the consequence that follows. Verse 7, only be strong and courageous, being careful to do according to the law of Moses, my servant commanded you. Do not turn from the right hand to the left. This book of law shall not depart your mouth. You're going to meditate upon it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to what is written in it. For when, for then, you will make your way prosperous and then you will have great success. And to that extent that we can confidently say where Joshua stands on God's word, where the Old Testament church purposes in their heart to follow Yahweh, to obey him and to worship him only, God has said, I will bless you and, and, and cause you to flourish. And in that sense, Joshua is actually a type of Christ where, you know, instead of Christ, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on a day and night. That's what, what Joshua's told sounds exactly like Psalm 1. For if the Messiah, the Christ, the man, that his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Just as Jesus' obedience to the Father in life and death, just as that resulted in him inheriting a kingdom, and securing peace for his people, so it is with Joshua. If he is to if he obeys God, if he walks in God's will, and he is strong and courageous to do that, then God will deliver them into the land and will bring blessing to his people. But he must resist that fear of failure. He must resist that, that fear of rejection of God's people. He must resist the fear that this is too hard or it's too, you know, it's too difficult, it's, too, it's impossible. I'm not Moses. I don't think I can do this. I recently, um, in the, the magnificent Land Rover project that you're all coming on this journey with me, the Land Rover, um, and so the engine's finished, people, so we're all happy about that. The engine's finished. And we're, we're pretty confident the engine will work. We don't know it will, but we're pretty confident it will. When I say we, we're using the rule we here. So I finished the engine project. Um, and with great hesitation, I've started to dis, uh, disassemble the gearbox and the transfer case. Trouble is, I have never, ever pulled a gearbox apart and rebuilt one. And... I certainly haven't pulled a four-wheel drive gearbox and transfer case apart and rebuilt it. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've wrestled with this for weeks. And I've been thinking, do I really want to do this? If I, once I start pulling it apart, there's no way back. And you can see what's happening in my mind. It's this fear of failure. 
keep saying to myself, maybe it doesn't need a complete rebuild. Maybe I could just get away with doing a service. Or, or maybe I just admit defeat and take it to a transmission specialist and maybe get them to do it. After all, I was thinking to myself, what do I know about main shaft and lace shaft and intermediate gears? But you know what the game changer was for me? Google's your friend. I, I found an online Land Rover club full of retired Englishmen with heaps of times on, on their hand and a, and a willingness to tell you how to do stuff. And so I jump online and I say, uh, don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Where do I start? And then these blokes literally pump out like a 74-point plan of attack. And so the online presence has given me the courage to face my fear of, me of mechanical failures. And so my gearbox is now in parts in the garage. And so it is with God and his people. God has promised his presence and his presence is meant to enable you to be strong and courageous and to face all your fears of failure. Now, in Joshua's case, the, the fear that he was facing is that, that well, Moses was a giant. And next to Moses, Joshua felt like a dwarf. And, and, and if the people of Israel grumbled against a giant like Moses, what will they do to someone like Joshua? And so Joshua felt that fear, which is why God spoke to him. And he spoke to him in his reluctance and his fear. And he said, I will be with me. Just do my will and my word and my presence will be with you. Therefore, be strong and courageous. What about you? I wonder what you are afraid to fail at. Now, obviously, we've had an object lesson in a fear of failure today. God, in his providence and no doubt humor, uh, has orchestrated this farce of getting a COVID positive um, result at 8.42 in the morning. Um, and, and I'm ringing up Daniel at about 8.43 going, so what are we going to do, bloke? Um, how are we going to do this? Are we just going to play an old sermon? Um or do you want to just roll the dice and try to do it online and see what happens? And, you know, Daniel, he's just a, such a risk taker. He's just like, come on, baby, let's just roll this dice. No, he was full of fear, and so was I. Well, actually, look, to be honest, I wasn't full of fear because it's on it's on the AV guys. It's on Daniel. It's on all those blokes. I don't know what I'm doing with any of this stuff, so it's not on me. I'm just a numpty in front of the camera. But but straight away, as, as, as we're praying to... to worship God and to consider fear of failure, we're given the situation where we're exactly that point, we fear failure. This is not going to go well. Should we just cancel church? Should we just play it safe and just do the readings but have no sermon? Maybe we can dredge up an old sermon and just throw that on the screen because there's little risk in that. What, what, what about you? What are you afraid to fail at? Is it school? If you're young, do you, do, are you gripped by fear about results about performance is it your workplace is it your marriage what about parenting do you fear failure at parenting oh if only the kids would stay between zero and six or seven actually let's let's just skip the zero to three stage but five to seven or eight they're cute at that stage then they become teenagers do you fear failure as a parent what about business you fear failure in, in running a business or managing or at your workplace or in your relationships, what is that area of your life? And if you can't track it down, often people who fear failure, it shows up in different ways, but, but often things like reluctance. What are you reluctant to do? What, what, what are the sort of areas in your life where you procrastinate? It just means, you know, you keep putting off. Those areas in your life where you're anxious, and it sort of means that you never actually get started. Or at the other end of the spectrum, if we were to do that, perfectionism. Perfectionism, you know, is where you only do stuff that you know you can smash. You'll only try stuff that you know that you're going to win at. You're not going to do anything that you can't do perfectly. You can't do anything that makes you look bad. What are you afraid to do because you might fail? What, what things 
or what things is God calling you to do that perhaps it fills you with fear? Maybe because, you, I don't know, maybe you don't have enough time. Maybe you don't feel like you're equipped. Maybe because you worry about what might happen or what others may say. What, what area of your life, what is God calling you to do as a husband or a wife or a teenager right now in your life that you're reluctant about or anxious about? Is God calling you to serve? Is he calling you to lead at home or at work? Could it be some area of godliness or purity? Is God calling you to deal with an addiction or a sin or a refuge? But you're procrastinating and you're anxious because you're, you're sort of afraid that you'll fail. I tried before and I haven't been able to do it. I'm not good at reading my home, not good at reading my Bible and praying. Uh, you know, I, I've tried to give up porn, but I keep falling back into it. Or I, I, I've tried to, to moderate my drinking or my eating or, or whatever the distraction or entertainment is, but, but I sort of fail. It's not just followers of Jesus in the congregation that have these fears. Church leaders are often afraid of failure. We're afraid sometimes to stand firm when the magistrate threatens us. We, we, we know what it is, fear. We're often afraid to plant churches and take a risk when our finances or our people aren't numerous. We're afraid to take a stand at times or to offer leadership because we're worried about the criticism that will come from both within and without. And so Joshua speaks to us because the solution to fear is actually the, the presence and promises of God. That's what enables you, it enables us to be strong and courageous and to face our fear of failure. If you were to saturate yourself in God's promise and presence, if you gather in his word and in worship, if you would be to be drenched in the divine. Imagine teenagers, if you were to be drenched in the divine, if you, if you got into the word, if you prayed, if, if the Lord's day became a delight, if as, 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 as adults, if, if, if church was our number one priority, if growing our faith was, was up there in, in our efforts for the week, that we were committed to reading and to praying and to following Jesus. So we're saturated with God's presence and his promises. You know what would happen from that? It would flow that you would become strong and courageous to face your fears. And the opposite is also true. People who are gripped by fear are often people who are not saturated or drenched in the divine. We all face fear. There's no getting away from that. We all have to deal with fear. But it's only as we are saturated in God's promises and presence will we find that virtue of courage to obey him even in the face of failure. Amen? Well, I'm going to lead you in a brief time of prayer. And then after that, we're going to sing a song of response, His Mercy is more and then if, if providence smiles upon us in a pleasant way and the technology works i'll be back in a few minutes and i'll lead you in a time of pastoral prayer so let's just pray father we we thank you for your word uh we are challenged uh that we need to be people who are saturated uh in the word of worship are drenched in the divine because it is only uh when we find that source of grace and strength, are we able to be strong and courageous and to face our fears and particularly failure? Help us to do that. Help us that what we purpose in our hearts, even if it's our, that you will help us to fulfill, that we might be people uh, who are intentional about prioritising you and that, that, that you would drench us in your presence that you would remind us of your promises, that you will not forsake us, nor will you leave us. Therefore, what can man do to us? 
And that will grip us in a way that fear does not. And that will enable us as a people to be strong and courageous. Hear our prayers because we ask all this in the blessed name of Jesus our Christ. Amen. Well, let's stand. We'll sing together a song of response. His mercy is more. Remember no wrongs we have done, omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their songs, thrown into a sea without autumn or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath a debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more we're all back and we're all good to go so i'm going to lead you in a time of prayer let's pray our gracious king uh we thank you that in your providence uh that you have loved us in your son uh that in your grace towards us that you've given us not just your son but his word and your spirit so that you can speak to us through the word uh father we thank you for your goodness towards your church, uh, your teachings to be strong and courageous, your promises and your presence. And we would ask our Heavenly Father even now that they may embolden and encourage us as we purpose to love and serve Jesus the Christ. As we come before you this morning in his name, we would uh, bring before you points of praise. Uh, we thank you for holidays, uh, festivities, family, friends. Thank you we can eat and drink together. Uh, most of all, we thank you for your son and his gospel. Uh, we thank you for the joy and blessings of family and particularly want to give thanks for the Bembo family and for the safe birth of Audrey recently. And we uh, just commend uh, both Jess and Audrey to you that you would bless them with sleep as well as Nick, who I'm no doubt is getting up and being a good husband too. So, Father, we just commit them to you. We also want to pray for individuals within our congregation and seek your blessing upon them as they move forward and serve you. We think of Joy 
this time and uh, think of the Bonga Frasers and uh, the Browns, the Almonds. Uh, we pray that you would bless our families, that you would strengthen their faith, that you would cause them not just to be faithful, but to be fruitful in your service at home and at work and in all their relationships. And as we pray for them, we pray for ourselves, pray for travel mercies for those who are moving around over the coming weeks, taking advantage of beautiful weather and holiday time. And we pray for them that you would bless them and keep them safe. And we look forward to them returning uh, safely in uh, the weeks ahead. We also pray, uh, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, bless our leadership as we plan for this year, uh, that you would give us unity and clarity uh, so that we might lead your people well. We pray for uh, young families, that you will give them patience and fun as they spend time with their kids. For our older members, that you would bless them and that you would keep them and that they might continue to be a great encouragement to those of us who are younger. We pray for those who are not well, uh, with sickness, uh, with depression, discouragement, COVID, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, so many aspects of living in a broken, fallen world that, that causes grief. And yet, over and above all that, uh, as we have our God uh, who promises uh, to provide for us all that we need, so give us the grace to navigate hard situations, difficult trials, and to do that in a way that honours you. Our Heavenly Father, we want to pray for our sister congregation at Bellarine, and we're mindful that they uh, have to move out of their building and they're looking to secure another one. And so we pray for those ongoing conversations that that deal will be uh, tidied up and that uh, this year, early in the coming weeks, perhaps even, that they'll have a new place to gather and to worship your name. And so we just commend them to you. We pray for all our other churches and particularly for their leadership of them, Geelong West, uh, the Lee, uh, Bannockburn, that you would bless and undertake for them in this coming year. We pray for our denomination uh, as we move forward. We pray that we might be a denomination which is strong and courageous. Pray that uh, we will not be wedded uh, to cultural approval, but rather to faithfulness to our God. And that uh, at all levels of the church, at all courts of the church, that our uh, major concern, indeed our only concern, is how can we be faithful to Jesus? And sometimes that will put us at tension with our culture, perhaps even with the magistrate. But Lord, we would pray that you would keep us faithful to you. And in doing that, that is the path of blessing, that we might be a blessing to the nations. And so, Lord, uh, we pray that you would give to us those strong convictions as leaders of your church. We would also pray uh, for this day as we move forward, uh, as we finish worship, as we gather in various places, that it will be a fruitful Lord's Day, uh, an encouraging Lord's Day, and that you would refresh your people wherever they may be. And so, our Heavenly Father, we would also pray for our magistrate. Uh, at times we uh, are in disagreement with those in authority, but nonetheless, we are commanded to pray for them and to submit to them um, where they have not overreached into the kingdom of God. And so, Father, uh, help us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, that we might right, rightly give to that which is Christ, his. And so, Father, give us wisdom for those decisions. Uh, we pray for our many missionaries that you would uh, preserve and bless them and encourage them, and particularly over what is a difficult and lonely time for them. So we pray that our prayers, our letters, our emails, our financial support, that that might be an encouragement to them. We also would commend to you um, our school teachers uh, for a break over the school time, over the holidays. We pray for those who are on the front line of COVID uh, in testing stations, which are overrun. Uh, we pray for hospitals and doctors and nurses, that you would preserve and bless and encourage them in their situations. And we pray for wisdom uh, for all those who are making decisions around this pandemic, that they'll be able to navigate all the competing interests with uh, great wisdom indeed. 
And so, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we would commend all these things to you. We would also pray for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, for the strengthening of our faith, for the adorning of our lives with, with great courage and strength, so that as we possess those virtues, the other virtues might flourish, particularly in times of trial and difficulty, because we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, conclude our last song of praise as we stand. We'll sing together, holy, holy, holy. Uh, sorry, no, Cornerstone, sorry. Cornerstone, that's what we'll be singing. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rage, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone called on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Christ alone call Blessing that was given to uh, God's servant Joshua that we have concentrated, dwelt on and meditated on this morning is appropriate for God's people in all time. And so I would read to you Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord is with you wherever you go, now and forevermore. Amen.
blessings, blessed tree.